Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, our guest is Paul Edwards. Paul is a strategic connector, ghostwriter, and the best-selling author of Influencer Networking Secrets, as well as the host of the Influence Networking Secrets podcast. Paul has lived in five countries, speaks two languages, has combat experience in the Middle East, and he's a voice mimic. I want to dive into that. But mostly, he's interested in words and people. When he isn't writing content, he's building relationships. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, Josh, thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. All right, so before we learn more about what sounds like a very interesting background here, tell us a bit more about yourself. Where did you grow up? What was your upbringing like? How did you become interested in writing? And full disclosure for the audience, Paul and I are both from the same hometown, which is Arcadia, California. We went to the same high school, and we just learned this about each other a few days ago. So it's fun to be talking to a fellow Apache. That's our mascot there at Arcadia High School. That's right. That's right. The the Apaches of Arcadia. I uh, actually we just missed each other. Um, you were uh, you graduated just as I think just a year before I started my freshman year. Yeah, I graduated so, ninety four, and then you started. I was I came in the fall of ninety four, so I ninety five would have been my first. First yeah, we, year, we uh, literally year. barely missed each other going to high school together. That's kind of weird, isn't it? It is, but, but here um, we are. I imagine we came across several of the same faculty and teachers, you know, during that time. So we could we could wax poetic about that. But you asked about my uh, <laughs> about my history, and um, it actually stretches back into this um, midwestern Canadian city of Edmonton, Alberta. That's where I was born, and. Um, my father is British. My mom uh, was South African and I was first generation North American, uh, so to speak. And um, grew up, you know, the first eight years in Edmonton, Alberta during the Wayne Gretzky years, then followed him when he came to Southern California in, in 1988. And um, lived the next 13 years, various places in LA, but the most, but, you know, ended out my, all four years of my uh, schooling high school uh, was in Arcadia and uh, lived a couple of other places in the San Gabriel Valley as well. Um, spent a year living on Santa Monica Beach, spent some time in the San Fernando Valley. So all those wonderful parts of LA, all the lovely weather. Uh, I miss that terribly now that I live in the Pacific Northwest where it rains nine months a year. Me too. I'm um, here in Boston. It's getting cold and I love the fall and the colors, but Man, there are days I'd like to head over to the beach and have some of that California weather to enjoy. I know it. Yeah, it's uh, you never miss it until it's gone. You never you when you're there, you just think, oh, it's a pain. It's always you're always sweating and hot, you know. But um, now I'll take the sweat and the heat because <laughs> it's getting pretty chilly out here. But anyway, um, <clears throat> you asked about writing. It's a curious thing. Um, I was about eight years old maybe a little bit younger, walked past my dad one day and I saw him typing furiously on the, on the keyboard on the, you know, back in those days, you had the early uh, PCs, the um, DOS and, and earliest versions, not even earliest versions of windows. It was all DOS. And uh, he, I, I said, dad, what are you doing? And he said, I'm writing my autobiography. And I, I'd never heard the term before. So I said, what's an autobiography? And he said, Oh, it's my life story. And I thought that was kind of cool. I was like, oh, I, I I didn't think about it, but my life has a story too. And so I decided at eight years old, I was going to write my own autobiography. It it didn't get very far predictably, but, you know, I put some meat on the bones and it was the first time I'd tried it. And for whatever reason, it just stuck with me. It just stuck no matter where I've been, what I've done or what occupation I've held, what position I've been in, single, married, um, I've always been writing. I've been writing song lyrics and poetry. I've been writing school plays. I've written, you know, stories. I mean, just, just, I've kept, kept, I've kept voluminous journals. I mean, I was looking at my, on, I keep a journal on Evernote the other day. I've got over 1500 entries in that journal. Wow. Um, no, but I, I don't know many people who have an Evernote account that big, you know, but I do because I just write in it every day. So, 
So that's that's how it happened. And, and then you get all these formative experiences, and we can we can get into that some more. But you know, the formative experiences of living overseas, living in different cultures, going to combat, being a soldier, being a father, being a husband, being in masterminds, you know, uh, becoming very very good at networking and creating strategic connections and all that. All of that contributes to having this wonderful set skill set and background that makes for such good professional writing, particularly for the influencer, thought leader, executive crowd. Now you got some of this experience writing when you were younger, but did you think of yourself as a writer? Is that how you identified yourself or at, or do you remember that point when you suddenly realized, you know what, I'm a writer. That's what I do. Funny. You should ask that. Um, I guess, you know, the, cause when we were when, like, when we were kids, like when you, around the time you and I were in Arcadia high, um, if you would have said, I want to be a writer, everybody would have said, good luck, dude. And maybe about two or three people on the planet successful with that. You know, yeah, that's, Tom that's Cl like uh, <laughs> being an artist or something, you know, you're going to starve to death if you're an artist. Exactly. Tom Clancy, that's about it. Right. And, um, so I, I guess I sort of, I didn't despise it, but I sort of put it away as one of these skill sets that you have, but there's nothing that you can really do with it. Right. Um, unless you're extremely lucky. And I didn't consider myself extremely lucky. I'm not saying that that's how it, how it even was in those days. I'm just saying that's what the extent of what we understood about it. So I just sort of put it to the side and said, well, I, I have this ability, but, um, I, I gotta, I gotta pay the bills and this, this doesn't pay the bills. So I went out and did a bunch of other stuff. Um, and it wasn't even until about this time last year, I got, uh, I interviewed Aaron Walker, who's my mentor with the iron sharpens iron mastermind. And he invited me to write content for his team. And I was, I had, I had failed so badly in business, 17 months with no income. Um, that I was at the point where I was like, you know what, I'll try just about anything that might give me a chance in the little time I have left before I've got to go find a job and just go back to, you know, doing something I really don't care to do. Which none of us wants to do. The last thing anything <laughs> any of us wants is to have a job. <laughs> Certainly not me. I've been fired enough times. I get, I just, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's not a, it's not a long-term strategy for me. Yeah. Having a job is a nightmare for an entrepreneur. It's like the worst case scenario. I mean, it, ju it just is. I mean, you know, um, I, I, I talked to my wife about becoming a freelancer with what she does and she's, she recoils at it. She functions really well in that paradigm. I don't, I, I just, I'm, I'm too loud and obnoxious and have too many opinions about things, I guess. But, um, but anyway, uh, Aaron invited me to write content for his team. So I started doing it and then all of a sudden people started saying, Hey, we need help with that too. And we, and we're willing to pay for it. And, and, and it was at that point, Aaron said to me, you know, I don't know what exactly you want to do for your business, but I see you've tapped into what is a high income skill that you can make a fair amount of money doing. People want it. The marketplace is hungry for somebody who <clears throat> is not only skilled and talented with words, but also can capture that person's voice. Right and can, can actually become you on paper, like a chameleon. And, and I had that, you know, you talked about the mimic. That's, that's, the, that's one of the linchpins of it is the fact that I can write something and, and I can read it back to myself in the, in the voice of the person who I'm writing it for. The mimic, it just gives me the ability to uh, write something and then read it back to myself aloud in the voice of the person I'm writing it for. Um, and then there's this part of it, you know, I don't, I don't really like to walk around and say this about myself, but people do business with me because um, I, I have to believe one of the reasons they do it is because I've learned to be more than just a writer to them. To me, it's, it's, it's about being a scout and a counselor and a, and a, uh, and a PR agent for people. Right. And that's where the whole strategic connections thing comes in. There, there's a, there's a, there's a highly relational character oriented side of my business. Cause let's face it. I mean, you could go on Fiverr or Upwork and find people to, to write stuff for you, uh, for pennies on the dollar. Right. Um, 
you just can't guarantee, well, you, you can't guarantee anything, but there are things that, about the kind of relational style that I do business and the, and the skill set that I've been given um, that, that frankly aren't available uh, through that, you know, well, they might be available, but they're, they're very hard to find going that route. So, right. Um, so what are some of those things? I don't know. Does that answer? Well, you know, the, the mimic, the, the, uh, the ability to capture someone else's voice, but also the, I, you know, I, I had to learn through years and years of uh, personal growth and development about, um, the, what business really is, right? Because we think it's all sorts of different things, but in, <clears throat> when it, when, when, it, when it boils down to it, we're talking about the privilege of serving God by serving one of his other children. That's what, that's what makes, that's what puts dollars in my pocket and butters my biscuit. It's not, it's, it's not the, it's not the talent, right? Cause I had the talent my whole life. What, what, what I lacked was the attitude of being uh, a servant of my fellow man. And that's, can I put that on paper and list it as a, as a, as an attribute? I don't think so, but I can, I can definitely feel it within me whenever I'm serving someone and whenever I'm having a, a conversation about doing business with someone. You know, I love that you just jump straight to that because a lot of people would beat around the bush and say, I like to help people or I like to serve other people, but you jump straight to making it, this is your connection with God. This is fundamentally who you are as I guess we could say a human being, but as a child of God or however you would phrase that, but this is really your core identity and the service that you're rendering to other people supports that core identity. I just love that you're willing to just throw it out there rather than hide behind it a little bit like a lot of people would. Well, I, I appreciate that. I um, uh, uh, Miraculous conversion at age 22 um, of, a, of a former um, sworn enemy of God, um, became a, a radical lover of him and a pursuer and wherever and whenever I've enjoyed success in my life, I've seen his hand move in ways, particularly when it comes to, uh, masterminds and coaching. I really believe he intended for that to be a, a model that everybody has some degree of in their lives. And I, re and I also believe that the, the reason for the lot, a lot of the disintegration and, uh, and, and destruction that we see in people's lives is because of the lack of it. So this certainly wasn't the way I was expecting this interview to go, but this is awesome. How do you see your identity, your relationship with God filtering into the work that you're doing? I mean, you've hinted at it, that you're, when you're serving your fellow man, you're also serving God, but on a day-to-day -day basis, when you take on a project, when you think about who you're going to work with and the type of work that you want to do for other people, how does your viewpoint, your belief in God influence those decisions? Well, I would say, Josh, that um, a, a big part of understanding who you, who you are and who you serve is first by knowing who you're not and who you don't serve. And in my book, I talk about this, I call it being the curator. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I find a lot of people like to say, I'm here to serve. I serve, you know, I want to, I want to serve other people. But I think that also involves, especially in this day and age, I think it involves also saying, I do not serve myself. I am not here to be served or to be waited on. I'm here to serve. I'm here. In other words, um, well, kind of like Jesus says, right? The son of man came not to be served, but to serve. That's a very explicit definition of, of who you are, but by extension, that's going to govern who you hang around. Right. And so as I begin to market, I begin to say, okay, in here is a room full of self-serving people. So I'm not going in that room, right? Over here is a mastermind group or a podcast hosted by somebody who very, who is very oriented the same way that I am towards true servanthood. And it just begins to narrow, you know, severely narrow the amount of time that I spend on anything other than pursuing my target market, pursuing my target connection or client or uh, associate, right? Somebody that I spend time with. From that, I've been able to distill 
this target client and it's it's really you know preferably faith based but it doesn't always necessarily have to be faith based um, somebody who's in in leadership and authority they're an executive uh, entrepreneur influencer um, they've got a lot to say and their words carry weight um, but not a lot of time in which to say it or print it or write it themselves and so that's where I come in and and fill in that gap for them cool I love that so you talk about being a servant, serving others, focusing on others, and then your book, Influencer Networking Secrets, a lot of people these days equate the word influencer with crazy kids on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and stuff, and people pointing at themselves and saying, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing. I have a feeling that's not what your book's about. So <laughs> what was the inspiration for writing Influencer Networking Secrets? What was the why behind why you wrote this book? Yeah, you know, the, uh, I, I, know what you, I know what you mean there. Um, I am not out there promoting the laptop lifestyle with the mimosas and the Lamborghini on the beachfront of Hawaii, not doing anything and getting paid millions of dollars in the meantime. Um, <laughs> I live in, I live in a nice, uh, four bedroom house in Olympia, Washington. I drive a Dodge. Um, I'm, a, I'm, you know, average guy, I guess, in that regard. Um, for me, here's, here's the thing. Um, I was always captivated by good delivery of something. And you know, when you see that, right, you know, when you see a movie where the acting is incredible versus a moving, a movie where the acting is pathetic, right? What's the difference? Cause, cause anybody can stand up and read lines off of a piece of paper, but not everybody can become that character that delivers them so well. Um, you know, when you hear, you know, a good radio or podcast program, because there's forethought and there's, and there's concentration and there's consistency and there's confidence in the voices of the people you hear. And you know, when you, and you also know when people are just getting on the, on the mic and hitting record and they don't really know what they're doing, right? You can tell. Um, it's the same thing in print. In fact, it's, I would argue it's even more so because you lose all of the intonation and body language that's visible in the video or audio format. Um, very often what you, <clears throat> what you put on paper can easily be misinterpreted, taken out of context. You can read the wrong tonality out of it because you don't know the person that well, or you're not very sure, or your internal anxieties and, and, and internal um, issues take over. I think almost um, all of us have had that experience of sending an email to somebody and then getting a response back and they're angry or offended. And you're like, no, I didn't mean it that way. But yeah, yeah you lose that tone. Correct. Now you think about that, Josh, think, just for a minute. What do most people do when they sit down at the keyboard? They write as they speak. They don't even think about it. Right. And I'm not blaming them or calling them stupid. I'm just saying this is, this is, this is why not everybody can do it because you have to be able to uh, cultivate this very strong empathy with the reader and say, what could I say? Or in many cases, what should I not say, <laughs> right? Um, that would persuade the reader, not, in a, not in, in a purely emotional form, but in a, in a form that engages both the emotions and the intellect, that moves them in a positive direction right? You have to know the checklists of what to write and what not to write and when to write it and not when, to, and, and when not to write it. You have to understand that there are things that you understand very well. You have a, a huge comprehension of, and your reader probably doesn't. You have to understand that you can talk all day. You can write, you know, voluminous books about a subject and, and people will have no clue what you're talking about but you're the object of the game is to get them interested in what you're talking about. So what do you put in your communique? That's what I specialize in. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your writing process with influencer networking secrets. How long did this book take to write, by the way, when did you start writing, working on it? I got started. Um, actually I was invited, um, by David Hancock to, uh, to submit it for, um, Morgan James, right around, I think, January, February of this year. So it took me a couple of months to write it. And, and, and I'll, if, in, in full disclosure, although it is a very honest and um, 
in my opinion, the, <laughs> the, the most thorough version of its previous two editions, um, both of which went under different names. Um, it's, it's not, it, I, I think I have another version of it still to come. And I'll tell you why I say that. Mm -hmm. um, since I started writing for clients, I, under, I understand now how much I was not fully ensconced in the research side of a book. And I feel like I should have spent more time really seeking to know what my target audience wanted to talk about. Um, but you asked me how long did it take? Um, it took me a couple months. You know, I was self, I, I, I'm, because I'm a writer, I do several self edits before I send it to an actual editor or anything like that. And I just, I, I, it wouldn't have taken me much more time to, in hindsight now, to have, I have a researcher on my team um, who digs into those topics for me and finds out what people's pain points are. And I think I could have done a better job in hindsight of being more incisive, straight to the point of what the audience actually wants to talk about. I don't know if that, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here, I feel like in answering that question, you can tell me if I'm rambling too much. Well, tell me about, you said that this is a new version of a book you had already written before. Mm -hmm. Do you mean you had that published once or twice before? Or do you mean you had the manuscript and you rewrote it and rewrote it? Or tell me more about that. Yeah. So when I first um, left, I got fired from the insurance business in 2018. Um, I was, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do and I felt compelled. I've got to do something. And so I wrote this first version of the book, which was called 10 secrets to networking success. It's what, and it's, you know, like any entrepreneur, right? It's the first version that, you, that, that several years later, you look back and you do one of those full body shivers, like, oh, oh I can't believe I wrote that. You know? um, but I self-published it. I found a local outfit that would publish it. It wasn't, you know, I, I bartered with an editor to, to get a, you know, some basic editing done, but it didn't, it was not a professional book like you would expect to see in, in, in bookstores. Last year, 2019, I decided to do a second version of it uh, called Business Beyond Business. I wanted to create a high, you know, a, a high performance mastermind group um, of, you know, those the super entrepreneurs like my friend Kevin Thompson does, only he's really good at it and I didn't know what I was doing. And so I, I published a second version of it. This time I went through bestseller publishing and they did a great job of making it a bestseller on Amazon. But I didn't, I still was like so, so much in the, in the, in the fog of what I wanted to do or, or how I wanted to do it or understanding what business was all about. And so this time I got much more clarity. I had proof of concept. I'd actually, you know, got, I'd actually succeeded in starting a writing business and all of that. And all along, my podcast had been growing. That was about the only part of my business that was continuing to grow. And my podcast is called Influencer Networking Secrets. And so I decided this time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and match the two together instead of having this over here and that over here and nobody sees the connection between them. Um, so I did that version of it. Um, it's, you know, it, it, is, it is very helpful. It will outline you know, everything that I've used, um, to, 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 to reach the success that I have. Um, but in full disclosure, like I said, I just, I feel like I could have done a little bit more on the research side. So when's the uh, next version coming out? <laughs> yeah, a little while I'm busy now. I've got, I'm busy writing other people's books instead of my own. <laughs> now, Going to your podcast, one of the things that we talk a lot about is, mm -hmm. on the published author podcast and in the groups that we run is the importance of setting up a platform. And your podcast, at least under this name, came about before your book. And so as you're marketing your book, how has the podcast enabled you to help get that book out, get the word out? Well, for one thing, you know, <clears throat> whenever you host a podcast, um, you get to, um, you uh, are actively engaged in what I refer to in chapter 
two or three of my book, which is called Pro Bono Publicity. And so one of the things that I tell people to do is, look, if you want publicity as a business owner, starting, especially starting from scratch, um, the best way to do it is to give it away to other people, right? To make a big deal out of the people in your network rather than make a big deal out of yourself. So I started, I started doing the podcast. I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, a business coach of mine at the time, Vince Del Monte, told me, you need to start interviewing people. Um, you need to start making a big, big deal out of influential people that you know. And several of the people in his mastermind uh, made great first guests. Um, so, so that was a good start. And then it sort of snowballed from there. And over time, what I discovered was that my show is, um, is the guests are as much the audience as the listeners are themselves. Um, when you do this and you provide a service to toward the people who also happen to be guests on your show, um, you know, I, I, it's again, it's not a sales, <clears throat> it's not a, a virtual closing room where I bring people in and try to <laughs> strong arm them into hiring me as a ghostwriter. Um, but it is uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to have a 60-minute conversation with somebody you otherwise probably couldn't get on their calendar, right? But because it's publicity, because it's it's helping them you know, gain exposure and all that, because you're taking time out of your day to be curious about them, um, I've found that I that I've been able to monetize it. I found that you know some of the people who come on the show end up becoming clients. That's great. Are there other parts of your platform that have been valuable for you? Do you have an email newsletter? Or do you are you active on social media? Is there anything else that's been a key part of getting the word out about the book and attracting the clients you want to attract? You know, I certainly tried. I got to say, I certainly tried, but but um, I found that to do social media right. Uh, to do email right, frankly, had a, a higher price tag and a higher time commitment than I had available. And I'm not saying I would never use them. I'm saying that when I'm in front of people, when I have conversations with them, when they get to know me and they feel comfortable and they they see how I speak and how I handle myself and all that, um, that I, I call that the low hanging fruit. Whereas I can send them an email a week for a whole year and not get a single reply. Mm -hmm. um, and not because my email is not well phrased or, you know, written as persuasively as I write anything else, but just because, um, and I, I don't know, it's like, maybe it's my personality or something. Just people do way better. They like to meet me in person. And well, it's like the saying goes, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And if I can see you and talk to you, or at least listen to you talking, so it's more personal experience through video or through podcast, then that is a step closer than reading what somebody has written. Yes, exactly. So with your plans for the future, what do you see in terms of the book helping you to build your business? How will you measure success? How will you know that the book was worth writing, worth putting the effort into getting it published? I've uh, I've had occasion to think about that some more, and I've said to myself, I think what what's going to happen is um, I've written a book that is reaching today people who will be influential and successful tomorrow, right? In other words, the people who reach out to me right now and ask for copies of my book. Um, and not because they are necessary, they, they like me, but not, that's not the main reason they're doing it. They're, they're doing it because they're interested in what I have to say. They're in, they know me, they know what it's like to be around me. They know, they see how I do things and how I make things happen and all that. Um, so it'll be a, it'll be a while. It'll be a long game to play with this, but that's what I think is going to happen. I think I'm, I think that the, the, the objective for me is to get this book into the hands of people who are not yet who they're going to become in the next five to 10 years. But if it gets into their hands and they implement it and they follow it and they, you know, it sinks in and they remember it, 
they're going to get to where they want to go faster than they otherwise would. Um, and at that point, you know, when they, I, I hear it now and then, you know, they reach, they reach out and they say, you know, I was reading what you wrote about and I went and tried it and it worked. And I didn't, I didn't think it was going to work. I, I didn't understand that um, going out and doing pro bono publicity for someone else was going to get me so much. I didn't understand that, you know, actually thinking about what I write before I write it and, and hit send was going to be so effective. Um, but thank you for, sh thank you for sharing that with me. Cause now I know. So you've shared some of the secrets, the influencer networking secrets here with mm -hmm. us. Are there any other secrets that would be particularly applicable to our audience, which is authors and aspiring authors, people who are getting ready to publish a book. Are there any of the secrets that stand out to you from the book that you think might be of great benefit to them? Yeah. Um, so in, in, in the, ch in chapter four, I want to say, uh, I talk about not for profit is for profit. And this is a saying I developed many years ago. And that is, <clears throat> um, whenever I'm active in benefiting the lives of other people who, who can't pay me, right. Um, for whatever reason, um, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a charitable institution. It's just a, it's just an expression, but I, but I find it now like in the, in the church that we go to, I go and mentor the younger men in the young adult service. You know, these guys who are all in their early twenties and just trying to figure out life. Uh, before it used to be, as a matter of fact, I <clears throat> found my way into being an, an MC of the local Miss America pageants. And so I would go and volunteer my voice and my time and get dressed up in a tuxedo and do the announcements for the, um, for the Miss America pageant. And I was active in the local um, association of the U S army supporting the military, but whatever you choose to be involved in so often those volunteers and, you know, boards of directors and all that are chock full of other entrepreneurs or people who have something of an entrepreneurial spirit to them. And you just show up at these things. And again, it's not with a sales agenda, but you show up and you, and you, you invest, I call it, um, doing good things and sending God the bill. And so I just, I just know it's not the reason I do it, but I go and I, and I know that if I, you know, if I remain selfless and, and just go there and, and serve and donate and give, and whether it's time, talent, or treasure, I know my father in heaven's keeping a record of that. And, and he intends to remunerate it, uh, how he does. And when he does, that's his business. But I just, you know, it's, it's just got to become one of those habits. And you might ask, well, how does this, how does this, um, how does this help a, you know, an aspiring author or an author? Again, so much of this business is relational, right? You can write a great book, um, but getting it, getting it publicized, appearing, you know, doing the, the publicity tour and all of that. Um, you're going to need stories. You're going to need something that's, that's authentic that comes across. Uh, you're going to need something that you really believe in. You're going to need something that stirs up your passion and excites you. And I've, I've, I've rarely met someone who's successful, who doesn't have, have some way that they, they call it giving back, you know, that, that, that they uh, benefit other people around them without charging anything for it. So, you know, have that in your, in your, in your arsenal. Another one, um, we've sort of touched on this a little bit. I call it persuasive in print, right? And persuasive in print is talking all about what we've, what we've already discussed is, you know, if you, if you sit down to write and you don't think about what you're writing, um, you don't get extra eyes on it. You don't do the research like I failed to do. You don't, um, you don't ask yourself the question. What, what do these people want to, want to hear? What, would, what could I talk about that would be compelling for them to stop and pay attention? Okay, you figure out what they want to talk about. Now you tell them why they should, why they should know about it, right? But why, it is, why is this important? Um, and then you get to the end of that and then you say, well, okay, how do, how do they implement it? How do they take 
what you've just given them and take it away and apply it to their lives. This governs everything we do in my agency. The content that we write for, for clients, the books that we write, we're always trying to, we're always asking ourselves those questions. What do people need to know, want to know, should know? And, and then why, and then how? What, what's the practical for them? So um, those two, along with everything else we've discussed, um, and, and, and there's more besides that, but those two I really think are strongly apply if you're, if you're uh, trying to get into business, trying to do the, uh, the author thing. Great. Thank you so much t today, Paul, for the time that you've given us. Paul's book, once again, is Influencer Networking Secrets. And his podcast is the same name, Influencer Networking Secret Secrets Podcast. Uh, Paul, any last words, anything I didn't ask you that you've been dying to get out? Josh, you've been most kind having me on. I really appreciate it. If, uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, um, I have a website, thepaulsedwards.com. Uh, or you can reach out to me on social media, the Paul S. Edwards. It's on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of them. It's all the same. Great. Thank you so much today, Paul, for the time that you've given us. Thank you, Josh. All right. I'm leaving it recording just in case the next part we want to leave in there. But I'm just curious to uh, ask you a little bit more about the religious side of things. And so if... Sure. If we decide to include this, then people are listening to this and they're just getting the extra stuff here. This is the uh, after show. So uh, which, so it sounds like you're Christian, uh, mm -hmm. which denomination or which religion do you go to? Or is it a non-denominational church or? It's becoming an interesting animal to define. Um, I've gone to evangelical churches for 18 years, mm -hmm. but I'm really, I'm really drawn to the Messianic Jewish tradition. Um, Tell me more about I that because I don't even know what that means. I mean, I can kind of guess, but I don't know what that is. Well, you know, you might have heard of things like um, Jews for Jesus. I've heard of that. <laughs> um, yep. I'm not, I'm only, I'm Jew. I'm, I have like a tiny sliver of Jewish ancestry um, from, I took that 23 and me thing in my my parents actually did genealogy and they found we do have a, a Jewish ancestor, but, um, so it's not a, it's not a bloodline thing, <clears throat> but, um, I, uh, I, I got to a point where I said, you know, I, I, I've always wanted to be a committed disciple, not just a guy who shows up in church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's meant different things depending on the phase of life that I'm in. But, but I, I found I found that the evangelical churches, they just, for whatever reason, that is a really hard thing to come by, right? And it could be many reasons. I don't want to, it's very easy to start, oh, the church, the church, I'm not going to blame the church. I'm just going to say that in my life, in my relationship with God, I want to be a committed disciple. So... Are, are all Messianic Jews committed disciples? I don't know. What I do find is that there is a much more holistic, investigative, research-based, and, and culturally accurate reading of, of the Bible, right? I find that there's, a, there's an attentiveness to the fact that there was 4,000 years, nearly 4,000 years, I think, of recorded history among the genealogy of the Hebrews going back to the time of Abraham and even before that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not that the evangelical church ignores that or says it doesn't exist. <clears throat> it's just that they, um, they use it um, sparingly for little bits and pieces of inspiration. And then I read the New Testament and there's so much of it that I'm like, I just, I don't understand why this, what this has to do with anything and why they mention this stuff that seems to be so random. Well, if you understand all of the history and culture that goes behind that, right? All of the symbolism, uh, if you understand the Hebrew language and all that kind of stuff, and, and I, I'm not claiming to be fluent in Hebrew, but I understand more of it than I ever have. Um, then all of a sudden, I, oh, now I see why, why they point that out. Now I see why that's there. Now I see what, what he means when he says that. So um, 
I don't know. I, I tend to get winded in these answers. Does this, does this help you see what I'm well, talking about? Yeah, this is interesting. So uh, I've heard of Jews for Jesus. My understanding is that, I mean, it, and with Messianic Judaism, I mean, is this like a specific organization, a specific church or a specific religion, or is it more a collection of ideas and a way of thinking about things? Because it sounds like you're part of an organized religion, right? I, I, I don't know. I, that's, that's a good question. I, um, I, you know, I, the, the church that we go to is a four square church. You've probably heard of them. Uh -huh. Um, they're an evangelical church. Um, okay. So the church you attend on Sundays is an evangelical church, but you, you're saying personally, you kind of identify with Messianic Judaism. Yeah. That right? Yeah. If it, in other words, if I could snap my fingers right now, um, then I would go on, I would go on Saturdays, um, to a Shabbat service in a Messianic Jewish, uh, congregation or temple, <clears throat> um, where it, you openly worship Jesus Christ, right? That's, he is the son of God. It's the same, it's the same doctrinally. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, it's, it's a different, yeah, there's a, there's a different lens, I guess you look at, um, look at it through. And, um, and yeah, I would lead a, like a Torah club, which is a, a Bible study, same type of thing. But, you know, um, I think, yeah, I, I mean, is it, is it an, is it an organized denomination? I don't even know. I've never looked into it. I, I follow certain resources online. It's called first fruits of Zion is, is one of the ones that I follow. And one of their, leading guys, pastors of church in Wisconsin, which is a Messianic Jewish congregation. I listen to their podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I honestly haven't looked into it to see, are, are they a denomination? Do they have a, you know, do they follow that, that model? I don't know. Okay. So this is just interesting. I'm super interested in religion, world religions, all religions. Um, and obviously, there are the there are these thousands of years of Jewish history leading up to the birth of Christ, and then Christ comes along, and of course he's Jewish. But then you have this branching or this division where a group of people go off kind of in a new direction. I guess it depends who you're talking to. It's all relative. If you're Jewish, you say, well, Christ and his followers went off in a totally different direction. If you're Christian, you would say, that Christianity is a continuation of all those years of history. That's what th was supposed to happen. And that it was the Jews at the time of Jesus who actually left and went off in their own direction. But one way or another, there was a split mm -hmm. and they moved in different directions from each other. It, so do you look back on what Christ established and you say, that's the religion, that's the true religion, that's what I wish were around today. Or uh, like when you say, if I could snap my fingers and have the religion I wanted, tell me a little bit more about what what that would look like for you. Yeah, well, um, one thing you mentioned was the, the split. And I actually <clears throat> read a, fan, a fascinating book on this recently by the, the guy I was mentioning there, who's the pastor in Wisconsin of the Messianic Jewish congregation. His name's Thomas Lancaster, and the book is called Restoration. And he points out that one of the things that the New Testament alludes to, um, in particularly in Acts, is that wherever Paul the apostle went and preached the gospel, the first place he would go is the synagogue. And in, and in nearly every time he did it, the Bible specifically says some Jews believed and some didn't, right? Some, were, some accepted it and some didn't. Mm -hmm. The research that he does concludes that a big reason that nobody really talks about for the split between Christianity and Judaism is the Roman Empire, right? Because there was the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and the um, terror the state-sponsored terror, if, if you want to call it that, of Rome mm -hmm. at the time. And one of the things that he argues that they do, or that they did, was that they sought to, to create enmity between the followers of the way, as it was called then, Christianity, uh, and the followers of traditional 
Judaism. And so there was this alienation, this sort of distancing, because we don't want to be involved with them. And then the other, we, yeah, we don't want to be involved with them either. <clears throat> but up until that point, the contention is that the new, the, the um, uh, church in its infancy regularly worshipped in synagogues that were tolerant of them. They would show up and they, and and if the synagogue welcomed them, then they would come in, and if it didn't, then they'd go meet in somebody's uh, in somebody's house or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the argument that they make now is that there is an invitation, not a legalistic requirement, right? Because there is scripture to support the fact that the Jews understood that asking Gentile believers to become ritually and legally Jewish, according to national rites of passage, which included circumcision, um, they, they understood that that was a stretch, you know, for Gentile believers who were coming in. But there's nevertheless, there's, a partic there's an invitation to participate in Torah life, right? In all of the all of the benefits that go along with that. And so what I've found is like, um, I now observe the festivals and the, the Jewish high holy days. Um, and I get, I get such restoration and renewal out of them. Um, because that calendar has been laid down for 6,000 years, right? We didn't have to invent a new one like the Gregorian calendar. We just follow the original. And there are days that God has appointed and said, rest on this day don't work on this day, right? Um, there are festivals, right? Celebrate during this time. Celebrate what? Well, celebrate liberation from slavery. Celebrate, um, you know, my rescue. Celebrate the way I've, uh, uh, I've passed over you, right? And, and all that kind of thing. Um, it, it doesn't look tremendously different. There's, a, there's, there's subtle differences. I observe Shabbat on Saturdays now, so I turn off my phone for the entire day and you know, good luck reaching me on, on Saturday. Um, but you know, whenever our church finally does open up and we resume Sunday services, we'll probably go to them. Um, I, I, you know, Yom Kippur was a few weeks ago, so I, I just didn't work. I, mm -hmm. I, I sat around and it was a beautiful sunny day and I went outside and sat out here in the driveway and in a, in a lawn chair and sat there and got soaked up the sun, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think I think it would look very, very similar, except there's certain days and times of the year um, I'm either not available or participating in certain activities with, with other believers. But that, I mean, that's the same as any, pretty much any faith, I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you're on this journey and you're in the middle of this journey still and uh, sounds like you're pushing forward and seeking something that matches your what you've read in the Bible, essentially. You're looking for that faith that matches what existed back then, or that is a continuation of those things. Yeah, I, I, when I look at <clears throat> um, some of the confusion we've created, have we created it? Did, did, did the Romans create it? Did, you know, I don't, I don't even, I don't even want to get into the blame game. I just say that there, there's a lot of um, things that we do in traditional liturgical or evangelical Christianity um, that quite frankly are, are not hitting me they're, they're, I feel, I feel vacant and numb with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um I don't, I mean, my family will celebrate Christmas. Yeah, we'll go over, we'll exchange gifts. I don't feel anything at Christmas. Um, I, I, I just don't. I, I've done it enough times and I see enough, uh, what do you want to call it, perversions or alterations of it or whatever. You know, I see all these people who don't even believe in God celebrating it. And I'm like, you know, um, And I just, I, I just, I didn't, I, I was like, this isn't giving, this isn't answering what I'm really after. Um, you're looking, you're looking it, for a more fundamental uh, path of discipleship, it sounds like. I want deep seated change. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have been such an idol worshiper and such a, 
so incredibly arrogant and self-righteous that I don't do well. I don't do anything in the shallows. It's, it's the deep end or bust for me. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> I, I, if I'm a brand new beginner at something, yeah, I'll do the shallow end for that, but I don't stay there. I want pedal to the metal. Give me, you know, give me all of it. If I choose to get involved in it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going until there's, there's nothing left. You're an extremist. I'm an extremist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I had somebody tell me too. She's like, I was uh, talking to a therapist and talking about some of my uh, thing challenges I was going through. And she's like, you're an extremist. Look at your calendar. It's all planned out. And everything you do, you do it 100% or you don't do it at all. And it's everything. Anyway, so when you talk two about it, I think, okay, <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah. What about you? I thought I saw you were LDS. Yeah, right. so I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, I grew up, that's the faith that I grew up in. I'm still active in it and as active as I can possibly be or trying to be as active as I can be. And I, but I love all religions. I love studying. I feel like all religions are connected. I think it's very interesting that everyone around the world believes in something. I mean, it's like 95% of the world believes in a higher power and it mm -hmm. cuts across every culture and every continent and every geographic group. And that is fascinating to me. And especially I love finding similarities between religions. And so I can look at the history of Islam and say, there are things in Islam that match up with my faith. I mean, they fast and yep. we fast and they wear certain clothing that represents their faith. And I wear certain clothing that represents my faith. And they're, they have certain teachings that match. I mean, they have a lot of teachings that match up with the teachings that I believe in. And they believe that Muhammad spoke to the angel Gabriel and that he gave him new information. And well, I believe in prophets from the Bible and the New Testament and that God and angels visited prophets and gave them information. So I see these similarities. And even uh, I just read, not the Bhagavad Gita, but I read a book about the Bhagavad Gita, or it was, a, I guess it was a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. But I was reading that and I was thinking, I had no idea. I didn't know anything about Hinduism. And I'm finding so many similarities between Christianity and teachings in the Bhagavad Gita. So that then I'm thinking, well, where did this come from? I mean, was this just somebody made this up or did God speak to somebody and say, hey, I'm going to give you this information and that's where the Bhagavad Gita came from. And so I, I love studying all religions. I believe that all major world religions at some level were inspired by God to help those people and to lift them up and help them live a happier life and prepare them for the next life. And so I just love studying all religions and hearing everybody's perspective and why they believe what they believe and what path they're on. It's just, it's fascinating to me. Yeah. I'll tell you this. I, um, my oldest son, we just signed him up for boy Scouts and I don't know how it is where you are, but here it's like 99% of the boy Scouts are LDS. <laughs> Yeah, we're like that's, the only <laughs> we're the only non LDS uh, father and son involved in the troop. Yeah, and, and it and it doesn't bother me at all. And and here's the reason why: um, when it comes to what they're like to live next door to, and how they are deeply involved in their kids' lives and raising you know solid intact families, man, you couldn't pick a nicer group of people and, and more thorough to live next to. Well, I'm glad and to I'm hear like, that. I'm like, shoot, I mean, this is, this is going to be a good influence. I don't care. I mean, what the, you know, maybe there's theological differences. Yeah. But I mean, he's going to learn exactly the kind of lessons that I, I struggled to teach him on my own. Cause I don't know all of this stuff, especially the outdoorsy stuff. I just, I don't know it very well, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I grew up going to scouts. I'm an Eagle scout and uh, oh, yeah. The church had kind of an official, quasi-official relationship with the Boy Scouts for, I don't know, last 70 years, 80 years or something. And they just separated a year or two ago or so. And in a way, it's kind of sad, but 
maybe it was time for that. But I think a lot of people from my church are still remaining active in Boy Scouts, even though there's not that official relationship between the church and the Boy Scouts anymore. But yeah, uh, yeah. well, thank you so much for talking about this side of things with me too. Are you okay with me leaving in this on the end of the podcast, just this additional casual conversation? Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm, there's, there's, there's not much, <laughs> I'm not interested in, in hiding anything. Um, and I'm not implying that you're saying that, but I'm just like, I want people to feel like they know me because that's the way that, you know, that's the way I succeed is people connect with something I say or how I say it or, and all that. And as long as it's the truth, you know, the right people will come out of the woodwork and, and, uh, and everything will be hunky dory. So, yeah. You know. Well, I appreciate that. I like sometimes to just leave things recording after the quote unquote end of the podcast, because so often there's another discussion after the podcast. And I think, oh, we should have been recording this. This is really interesting. People smart, might be interested yeah. in this. And so I'm glad we had the chance to do this today. Well, Paul, yeah. once again, thank you so much. I'm glad that Ryan introduced us and we were able to get together for this. It'll be a few weeks before the podcast is released uh, because I've got a ton of work to do launching this whole thing from scratch. But I appreciate this. And once it comes out, I'll send you all the info and uh, the emails with all the assets to share it out and everything. And I hope it results in some traffic coming your way. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit PublishedAuthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources.